Hello, everyone. We'll wait for everybody to join us. It'll take a few minutes. It says I'm still in a, in a practice session. Oh, there, there we go. Okay. okay, there we go. Hello, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery's webinar, Mending Necessity and Expression with Caitlin Carbonic. We're going to wait for everybody to join us. There's quite a few people tonight. We have 71 who are registered for tonight's session. We're so excited. Um, happy to have you all here. So if you are from somewhere other than Red Deer, please uh, let us know in the chat. Say hello. Say where you're from. We'd love to know where people are are um, uh, coming in from. Hello, those of you who are jumping in. Okay, Edmonton, from Edmonton, Winnipeg, wow, Sherwood Park, Calgary, ah, Stetler, Ottawa. Hello, hello, from Mirror, Winnipeg, Pennsylvania, Waterloo, Ontario. Wow, we have people from all over, Toronto. This is fantastic. From far away, <laughs> that's excellent. Outside Calgary, Surrey, BC, Ohio. Wow, welcome, welcome, Sherwood Park. This is fantastic to see everyone. So glad you can join. This is the nice thing about doing things live is we get to see people from every Melbourne, Australia. That's the opposite side of the world. This is fantastic. Welcome. We'll give everybody a few more minutes to come in. I see there's some people chatting. Surrey, everybody's coming in. Excellent. We're so happy to have you all join us here. We feel so humbled in Red Deer, Alberta, that there's people from joining us from all over. Vancouver, welcome. Okay, we've got 57 joined. We have 71 registered. I'll give everybody a couple more minutes. Uh, I will begin by just introducing myself. I'm the education coordinator, Lynn LaCour, uh, and I'm with the Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery. This program is uh, Art Speaks, and it is a collaborative program between the Red Deer Museum and the Red Deer Arts Council. You will see Suzanne Hermery. She will, uh, she can wave to you and uh, we'll spotlight her in a few minutes and she'll talk a little bit about the Red Deer Arts Council. Um, and then of course, I will give Caitlin a proper introduction. Uh, I'll just give everybody a couple more minutes to join on. And then I'll give a little bit of um, how the evening is gonna go and tell you a little bit about some of the upcoming events that are happening at the Red Deer Museum. And then we will turn it over to Caitlin. We are gonna be here for approximately an hour and a half. So give or take a few minutes. Um, we're gonna have a wonderful webinar and then a demonstration. So hopefully some of you have some mending with you to, uh, to uh, mend along with Caitlin. But uh, before we begin, anything, I would just like to acknowledge that we are on Treaty 6 and Treaty 7 territories. Treaty 6 is north of the Red Deer River and Treaty 7 is south of the Red Deer River. And we respectfully acknowledge all of the First Nations, Inuit and Métis people who have walked this land before us. So welcome, we still have a few people joining us, but I think what I'll do is I am just gonna talk a little bit about um, some things that are happening at the MAG and at some upcoming programs. So first of all, you are joining us with our Art Speaks program, our collaborative program with the uh, Arts Council and the Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery. And we are really happy to announce that we have got some funding from the ATB Bank, the Alberta Treasury Branch, who has um, provided a uh, sponsorship for us and so all of our art speaks programs this year for 2021 are offered free so we are happy to have so many people access this wonderful program and yet we can still pay our artists and be able to offer all these talks for free so a big uh, shout out to uh, ATB Financial. And because of that, they had one request. They wanted to be able to do a webinar themselves to give a talk on finances for artists. So next month 
April 21st at 6.30. You can join us again for free, thanks to a ATB, and hear from Derek Stevenson as, and his team as they talk about finances for artists and maybe some tax tips as well. Our original scheduled uh, speaker for April 21st was Elizabeth, our very own uh, human resources finance manager at the MAG here. Um, but we decided to postpone her talk on tax tips for artists until the fall. We figured it would be a, a better time frame in which that artist could access her knowledge before tax season instead of just at the tail end of it. A few of the other virtual programs that we have happening at the MAG is we've started a Beating Basics uh, Club with Teresa Cardinal, and that's happening uh, once a month for the next three months, April 8th, May 6th, and June 3rd. It started last month, but you can still jump on and you can register at the MAG. Uh, we have a curator's talk on Sunday, March 28th at 2 p.m. for our exhibit, our uh, carbon copy exhibit with local artist Tina Dickerson and Jennifer Warner from Calgary. Unfortunately, with COVID, nobody's been able to uh, see this exciting, beautiful exhibition. So please join us on Sunday, March 28th at 2 p.m. And you will have a curator's talk with Pat and Joanne, and they will be able to show you sort of a live presentation of the exhibit. We also have another MAG sampler coming up on Sunday, April 18th from 1 to 4 with Caitlin Carbonic, who I will introduce you with shortly. She will be doing an embroidery uh, workshop on stitches based on some of the textiles in our collection. So if you are happy with the presentation with Caitlin tonight, so please join us again on April 18th and have an actual hands-on webinar on embroidery. So I see that we still have uh, 58 participants. So welcome again. Thank you very much for joining us. I want to formally, uh, before I formally introduce you to Caitlin, I want to turn it over to Suzanne with the Arts Council and she might have a few words on some of the things that are happening in her organization. Thank you. Um, so uh, hi everyone. My name is Suzanne Hermery. I'm the coordinator for the Red Deer Arts Council. And we are a local charity uh, supporting arts and creativity in Red Deer and Central Alberta. Um, we actually serve a much larger region than just the city of Red Deer. Um, we're so happy to be able to work with the museum and uh, to have this funding from ATB to make this available to everyone because Opportunities to learn are great, no matter where you are, when you are, and that's kind of the beauty of Zoom is that we can have somebody from Melbourne, Australia join us, so that's wonderful. Um, what's happening with the Arts Council? Well, here in Red Deer, we're still under some COVID restrictions, so I hope to set up a, my, my winter concert series in spring, um, but uh, right now we're not able to do that quite yet, but hopefully in May we'll be able to put our... Uh, music to the test again and uh, do that up on the Ross Street patio. I have a gallery exhibition right now at the Red Deer Public Library downtown branch and it is uh, art in the time of COVID. Uh, so it's all works by members of our visual arts community and uh, they submitted pieces created during the pandemic and so there's a really nice uh, variety of works available um, with regards to isolation, but also reclaiming our beautiful love of uh, landscapes and so forth uh, that we have here in Alberta. So it's really wonderful and varied. Um, it is also going up on our website at uh, reddeerartscouncil.ca and you can check out the Kiwanis Gallery tab to find out more there. Uh, what else do I have uh, right now? Just uh, working on all of our, our summer plans. We're hoping to do the In the Neighborhood concert series again this year and make it even bigger and better working with Red Deer County and the City of Red Deer. Some other exciting uh, details. Culture days this summer or this fall, I should say. So thanks so much and I hope that you enjoy and uh, looking forward to hearing from Portland. Thank you. Thank you. So now we're going to turn it over to Caitlin. Caitlin Carbonic has her master's, an MA in as a dress historian and a professional stitcher. 
Her work centers on the role of making and the experience of wearing dress as sources of knowledge. She also has an active natural dye practice and a sustained interest in mending, as you were going to learn soon enough about her mending demonstrations. Caitlin has a Bachelor of Science uh, degree in clothing, textiles and material culture and a master's degree in material culture from the University of Alberta. She is currently working at the MAG Forest as our textiles curator. She will be pulling pieces from the collection for you to take a look at tonight. Uh, she will zoom in and do some close-ups on some of the pieces that she's pulled from the collection that need some mending and that will help to complement her talk and uh, the necessity of mending and the creative options that it can that can arise through mending. Uh, so during her presentation, you're going to see a PowerPoint. She's going to pull out some of these objects. Afterwards, she's going to do some demonstrations of mending. So hopefully some of you have some mending and you can mend along with her. Please feel free to uh, write your questions in the Q&A chat box during the demonstrations. So after her presentation, I'll open it up for questions, Q&A, and um, she can be demonstrating and we can have it a very interactive time. So put your questions in Q&A. I will read the questions because there are many of you and I hope to get to everybody's questions and uh, then she will answer them live as she's demonstrating. That's probably the most efficient way of, of doing this. So I'd like to welcome you, Caitlin Carbonic. Hi everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, as Lynn said, my team and I were really excited that so many of you signed up um, and that we're welcoming people both near and far today. Um, so I'm just going to start my, like, like Lynn said, we're going to be going from a presentation to objects, um, which might be a little bit um, difficult, but I think that, there we go, it was the, the first object. Okay, let's get going. All right, so as Lynn said, my name is Caitlin Carbonic, and I'm the Associate Curator of Clothing and Textiles here at the Red Deer Museum and Art Gallery. And right now, my job here is to go through and catalog the entire collection that we have in Red Deer, object by object. So far, I have looked at thousands of objects, and I feel really fortunate to have this job because I've been able to get this very detailed look at dress through actual garments and accessories that were worn which is a somewhat rare thing amongst dress historians. Usually we spend a lot of time looking at pictures and reading books. Today, I'm here to talk to you about one of my favorite topics um, and the thing I get most excited about when I come across it in the collection, and that is mending. One of the joys of getting to look at objects up close every day is that I get to see easy to miss details. Lots of garments that ended up in our collection have been mended um, many of them were considered valuable to their owners and therefore have been mended. Many of the, time, many of the items also date from a time when mending was more prevalent, um, which we're going to talk about in a little bit. So here's the plan, because it's good to have a plan. I'm going to start by talking a bit about some of the meanings and associations that mending has using some objects from the MAG's collection and photos and resources from other sources. Then I'm going to demonstrate one or two simple mends um, and at the same time hopefully answer some questions. And I encourage you all to bring your own mending projects or just whatever you happen to be working on today. The goal here is to explore some of the many meanings that can be associated with mending using some examples from our collection. And most of these objects have not been seen before by the public, so this is really exciting. And then to finish off with a demonstration. I like to always include a hands-on portion of my talks because even if you aren't following along or doing whatever I'm doing in the demonstration, seeing how things are done can contextualize what we just learned or what we just went through. Also, I find that doing a demonstration of sewing techniques has an interesting ability to both make the amount of labor more apparent and often make the task seem more achievable. Um, not for everyone, but that's fine. <laughs> um, and though I do a lot of solitary mending, I also consider it to be a very social activity. Back before the pandemic, I used to host mending parties at my house, which one is pictured on the left. 
Um, and I also volunteered to mend clothing in my community um, on the right. Mending for me is a way of connecting with others, and I want to call a little bit of that into our talk here tonight. That's why I've encouraged you to bring any mending projects you might have, and if you want at the end, please feel free to share what you're working on or maybe some memories and associations that you have with mending. And obviously questions are very welcome. So, what is mending? The Oxford English Dictionary defines it as to restore to a complete, sound, or usable condition, something broken, worn, torn, etc., to repair or make good a defective part, or to fix. This definition is not specific to textiles, and it actually is not even specific to physical objects. Mending is a physical practice, but it can also be considered as a metaphor. There are a lot of different reasons to mend and an almost unlimited number of ways to do it. I'd say that for probably about as long as people have been wearing and making textiles, people have been mending. I'm now going to talk about some of the traditional, more practical reasons to mend, and then go on to explore mending's entry into mainstream fashion in the 20th century, as well as its more recent evolution into an artistic and meditative practice. So, one of the main associations people have with mending is practicality. Mending is a useful way of extending the life of the things we wear. Oh. Um, sorry, my team just told me my PowerPoint's very small. I'm gonna try and, how big? <laughs> Can you? Hmm? Do you want to come help me? <laughs> uh, Caitlin, just at the bottom right hand of your screen on your PowerPoint, you'll see the presentation slideshow button. This one? Is that it, Carly? No, it was at the bottom right when you had options there, and it was just a little icon for presentation mode. I'm not sure if we're seeing the same things right now. Yep, right there. This guy? Okay, that's a bit better. Continue. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Anyways, um, where were we? Yeah, so one of the main associations people have with mending is practicality. Mending is a way of extending the useful life of the things we wear. Instead of buying a new garment, we can mend it. Most mends have some element of practicality to them, and most of the mends I come across in the Max collection appear largely practical in nature. Practical means different things at different times and to different people. Sometimes practical mending prioritizes just fixing the thing and not necessarily the aesthetics. And to illustrate that, we're gonna look at our first object. Let me just stop this share. All right. <laughs> so these are a pair of mittens, um, hand knit mittens in our collection. And they were one of the first items that I came across when I began working here that had just a really mind blowing example of mending. Um, I love them for multiple reasons. They're hand knit color work, and I'm a knitter, so I really appreciate this. And they're pretty, but made out of a dense, hard wearing wool. They would have been very warm in the winter, 
And I think, well, the most amazing thing about them is the mending. They are well used and have been mended several times using different techniques and several different colors of wool. So I'm going to pick one up to look at it more closely. You can see here that they're just, it's just layers and layers of mending. Um, it looks like they were mended and then the mend wore out. Um, and so they were remended on top of that. I'm assuming that these mittens were in use for several years and mended over that entire time. Um, the cuff has been replaced and then mended. Um, there's, there's two or three different techniques of mending. To me, these mittens just scream, I don't have time to knit another pair of mittens, but it's cold right now and I need them, um, which is a very practical sort of mending. Um, in contrast, sometimes practical mending means making sure that the mend is not visible, or at the very least not noticeable. Um, we have a lot of this kind of mending in the collection right now, and I'd like to show you here, I need to move this up, a white cotton Oregon blue gown um, that showcases this kind of mending. Here, let me get a full screen here. We are. All right, so let's look at it up close. Um, first, I'm going to show you just some details on it. It has a lot of hand embroidery, um, and it's really, really beautiful. just absolutely lovely um, and a very delicate fabric. Now we're going to... Now I'm going to flip it over to show you the part that has been mended. All right. So given all the handwork um, that went into this fashionable gown, when the delicate fabric wore out, the owners chose to mend it rather than get rid of it. Um, however, using the same colored thread and fabric for patching preserved the look of the garment and therefore its function. You can see right here, um, we have some little darns like we saw on the mittens, um, but these are, these are much finer and they're done in the same in the same color thread to match the rest of the gown. Here we have two larger tears um, that were mended by placing a patch underneath in matching fabric um, and then stitching the edges of the tears down so that they didn't fray. It's very beautiful work another one here. Tiny, tiny little darn. Alrighty. These types of mends are finer and a bit more challenging to execute than what we saw in the mittens. However, as I said, the extra effort preserves the function of this fashionable garment. Now we're going to go back to PowerPoint. Good. <laughs> a third kind of practical mending is mending that is nearly completely invisible. This takes quite a lot of skill and used to be offered by some dry cleaners and tailors as a professional service. And you might actually still be able to find it in some places. I haven't seen it recently. I keep an eye out, but all right, so I need to change my share. 
going to show you a video of this technique. Okay, here we go. Um, and so what we have here is a suit and she's cutting away, or the person who's, who's doing this mend is cutting away the lining so that they can get to the underside of the fabric. Um, back when we tested out playing this video over Zoom, it was a little bit laggy. So if you're having trouble seeing what's going on, Lynn is gonna put a link to this video in the chat so that you can look at it on your desktop or later. It's a really, really neat technique. Um, so what's happening is the person is taking a patch of fabric might have been taken from a hem or somewhere in the garment um, and unraveling the edges of it and then placing it over top of the hole on the right side of the garment, so the outer side of the garment. And they're aligning it, it's, really, it's easy to align um, stripes, so they're aligning the stripes um, with, the main, with the main fabric of the garment and then they're grabbing each individual yarn in the patch and pulling it into the fabric of the of the original garment. You can see that that the person has a needle with a thread loop um, threaded through it and that's the part that's grabbing each individual thread. go and they just go all the way around. I remember once I found a pair of pants um, in another collection that I worked with that had a cigarette hole burned into them um, and then they had invisible mending over top and I almost missed it completely because once it's done you can you can barely see it at all unless you're looking for it or unless you know it's there. Another way to do this, if you don't have a large enough patch of the original fabric, is to take a bunch of yarns or threads from different places in the garment, so different seams or the hem or wherever, um, and then reweave the fabric thread by thread over top. This takes more time, um, and when you have more complex weaves, it can be quite difficult. But the results really, yeah. It's, it's, it's invisible mending, that's what it's called. And there's the last side that they're doing. That's what it looks like on the inside. So you can see the hole, it's completely covered. And then they press it really hard. <laughs> I guess to probably, um, the thing you're most likely to see is a change in texture on the top. So probably just to flatten it so it looks smooth. I believe that this mend, it's called the magic of Keketsugi restoration. Um, I believe Keketsugi means invisible mending in Japanese. Um, but I know that this technique is practiced in other parts of the world too. And yeah, if you weren't looking for it, if you didn't know it was there, uh, you probably wouldn't see it. It's magical. And there, they sew back the lining over top and it's like it never happened. Question, Caitlin, coming in from the chat. Um, there's a comment that the needle appears to have a special blade to it. Is that correct for this particular video and mending? I'm not sure. Um, my understanding of invisible mending is that you don't need a particular type of needle. 
I will say that I also noticed that the needle appeared to have like it looked almost like a like a leather needle where it has the um, sort of like triangular like pyramidal shaped tip. Um, but no, I'm not I'm not totally sure why they chose that needle in this video. Good question. Right, so let's go back to the presentation. Go. Great. So yeah, those are three examples of practical men's. Uh, and I chose them because I think they show how practicality can mean different things at different times. Sometimes it means just getting the men done, whether that means it's visible or not. Sometimes it's sort of a combination. Um, and other times you want it to be completely invisible. So historically, most mending has been practical in nature. In the past, new clothing was more expensive, and so being able to replace clothing when it wore out was a privilege. We can't really talk about mending and all the good things about it without talking about poverty. The definition of poverty in the Oxford English Dictionary is the condition of having little or no wealth or few material possessions. So in some cases, extending the useful life of one's material possessions becomes a more necessary skill. Sometimes mending can have unpleasant associations with being too poor to replace broken clothing, and some people view mending negatively because of this. An example of this comes from my mom, who told me that where she was growing up, having visible damage or visible repairs on your clothing was something negative that would make you the target for teasing or bullying. I have the privilege to say that I have never been in a position to experience that, and it is something that I think about in relation to my current mending practice. I'm going to go on to talk about the recent trend for visible mending. However, it should be remembered that the ability to show off mended clothes as a fashion statement is a privilege that is not given equally to everyone, even today. Regardless of the situation, mending is an expression of care and attention. Sometimes that care may be purely materialistic or cost conscious, but quite often it is also an expression of emotional care and tenderness. Next, I'm going to read a short excerpt written by artist Celia Pym about her great uncle Roland's sweater, repaired by her great aunt Elizabeth, that she inherited after they both passed away. Just to note that the sweater pictured here is not the sweater described in the passage, but it is some mending by Celia Pym that I thought might resemble the, the sweater she's talking about in the excerpt. I thought a visual would be nice and I hope you'll forgive my slight bending of the truth. So, the excerpt. The sleeves on Rolly's sweater were worn out in exactly the spot where he pressed his arms against the drawing board. I liked seeing this evidence of his body actions in the sweater. I was also moved imagining my great aunt Elizabeth repairing the sweater. Elizabeth's mending was a reflection of her practical character. The yarns did not exactly match. Some of the darning was not very densely done, and one of the holes was patched with a small piece of knitting. Her repair was purposeful, not decorative, but it had an individual style to it that I loved darning layered one on top of the other. One of the sleeves was so worn out that her repair had almost replaced the original wool. And that's by Celia Pym from Mending Anatomy, Making Your Hands Knowledgeable. For the author, her great uncle's sweater expresses the loving relationship between him and his wife. She can see evidence of both her aunt and uncle's personality in the mending of the sweater and the care and familiarity that they had together. It also talks about the relationship between a person's body and their clothing that mending renders visible. The mending in the sweater reveals the body of the wearer and his behaviors. Giving a piece of clothing to someone to mend can feel extremely intimate because you are giving another person access to your closest physical environment the very imprint of your body. 
Another thing we can tease out of this passage that I find interesting is that the meaning of this mending is different for both the author and the mender. For the mender, Aunt Elizabeth, the mending was practical, but for the author, it was both practical and aesthetically beautiful. In the Mags collection, we have an object that for me is a really incredible example of the expression of care through mending. Just gonna switch back to the camera. Right. So I remember when I pulled this cardigan out of, for the first time um, in the collection, and it absolutely blew me away. I don't, I'm not sure I've ever seen a garment that is this extensively mended. There was very little information about it um, in its museum files, so we don't know who mended or owned it nor why they decided to go to such extreme lengths to repair it. It has a ton of mending. Large portions of it has, have been completely replaced by mending, either from being rewoven or patched with another fabric. So I'm gonna do a close up, uh, do a little scan of this amazing thing. Um, Here's a big patch. It's replaced almost the whole right side, the bottom right side of this cardigan with another green wool. I also find it interesting that the person, um, whoever mended it used three different colors, um, but they seem to especially favor the red. Um, so either matching with the green um, or red. And this part, this sleeve, has been almost completely rewoven. It looks like at different times because the green and the red are interwoven together. There's some black at the cuffs. I find this artifact intriguing and inspiring. Put this back up here. Take a look at it. Go. Calling back to our discussion about poverty and privilege, we can't know for sure if this garment was mended because the owner could not afford to replace it. This is very much a possibility. However, did the, however it is clear that whatever the reasons, um, this garment was cared for. To me, it represents how we feel about some of our favorite garments. We might keep them beyond when it seems reasonable to an impartial observer. It's back to the presentation. Okay. So we're gonna move on now to talk about fashion and aesthetic expression. In the mid 20th century, the reasons for mending clothing shifted from largely practical concerns towards an interest in self-expression, creativity, and sometimes political activism. And before I jump into this section, I want to acknowledge that fashion is a very complex phenomenon for which it is very hard to draw concre concrete conclusions about what different movements or trends mean and why. I'm going to be talking about one specific trend that influenced mending practices, and I acknowledge that this is only one small part of what was going on in fashion at the time. I don't want it to be normative. Sometimes I find discussions about fashion to be very normative. Um, Anyways, now that I said that, a significant contributor to the uptick of more visible forms of mending was a trend for a, a patchwork aesthetic beginning in the late 1960s. Patchwork is a method of using small remnants to create larger fabric pieces that can be made into garments or other textile objects. From then and into the 1970s, there was an increased interest in traditional handicrafts and non-Western aesthetic traditions that shaped and fueled this shift. This evening ensemble, 
um, was designed by Adolfo uh, from 1967 and reclaims a Victorian crazy quilt into a woman's evening gown. Crazy quilts were popular handicrafts made domestically in the Victorian period using scraps of fabric. Here, this aesthetic is rehashed into a high fashion outfit. In terms of non-Western aesthetic traditions, movements such as the hippie movement, where Eastern philosophies were brought into the Western slash European psyche through the movement of Western people along the hippie trail, which was overland from Asia through Europe, influenced fashion. This kaftan, designed in the West for Western com consumers, features patchwork type designs and a style of garment originating in the Middle East. Though the number of people who actually traveled along the hippie trail was relatively low, the movement of goods and ideas had a lasting impact on Western culture at this time. Fashion, or the way we dress, happens in relationship to the social and political movements of a time. And in the late 60s and early 70s, there was a great deal of social upheaval that can be related to this change in aesthetic sensibilities. A rejection of post-war consumerism and a critical engagement with social and environmental issues is reflected in the newfound acceptance and mainstream fashionability of pat patchwork in Western dress. Here's another example of patchwork in mainstream fashion. This is an advertisement in the January 1975 is issue of Chatelaine for a mail order patchwork quilting pattern for a quilt, a full length skirt and a bag inspired by Mola reverse applique textiles of Central America, which I thought was matchy matchy and awesome. It's another example of the increased interest in handicrafts and non-Western aesthetic traditions within the fashion for patchwork at this time. And if you didn't want to do patchwork yourself, patchwork like prints and designs were also produced like this example of a printed wrap skirt and shirt ensemble in our collection here at the MAG. And to bring it all back to mending, this fashion for patchwork was a wonderful moment for the repair of clothing. A patchwork effect can be created by using visible patching on garments. Patchwork created the opportunity to make mending a big part of the look of a garment and for people to show off mending as a design feature. And in our collection, we can see this on a pair of jeans that we have. So let's do the next, the next, next object. Da, da, da. All right, here we are. These jeans were worn in the late 60s and early 70s by the donor, um, and they were decoratively patched by the donor's mother. The patches are unevenly worn, indicated that they were mended multiple times. These jeans are actually very well worn. Um, so I imagine that they were worn for probably a couple years. And that probably the mending kept them usable beyond their normal lifespan. Um, and what I love about these jeans is that they embrace the fashion um, for patchwork and visible mending um, just so completely. So love the, the cute fabrics that they chose. Um, and there's also some decorative embroidery you can see here. Go to the other leg. Cut. Cute frog. Some areas that are more susceptible to wear have multiple patches over top of them. Was really cool and yeah I just find this to be a really unique time in history where you know it was okay to wear jeans that were worn that were very visibly mended um, yeah they're they're great
right. And now I want to look at where mending has been going more recently. Many people continue to look towards mending as a tool of repair for their worn clothing. However, some now go beyond this and see mending as a tool for the repair of broader social, environmental, political, and sometimes personal issues, even if only in a metaphorical way. A unique characteristic of this point in social and economic history is fast fashion, which is the production of an ever-growing amount of clothing at cheaper prices very, very quickly. We are now able to replace clothing items at a historically low cost and respond to trends on a weekly basis instead of two or four times a year, which is the traditional fashion cycle following the seasons, fall, winter, and spring, summer. This increased consumption creates a greater environmental and social impact that is very likely to be unsustainable in the long term. Also a quick digression, this photo is of an installation art piece by French artist Christian Boltanski to explore themes of memory and the transience of people and lives. Essentially what he did was fill an enormous warehouse space in Paris with clothes with a big central pile that you can see here. It's not necessarily about fast fashion, however, photos of it are used all over the place to talk about fast fashion. I included it because it's such a great visual, and also because I think it's funny that this art piece probably would have been prohibitively expensive to create in any era before fast fashion. Anyways, this increase in volume and decrease in price from the rise of fast fashion has fundamentally changed the way we think about our clothes and therefore our relationship with mending. Mending is now sometimes used as a political statement about the disposable nature of most of the things we buy. I thought that this idea was summarized nicely by the editors of Digits and Threads, which is a Canadian online publisher of textile arts and craft content. So at a time when cheap fast fashion and disposable electronics seem unavoidable, revisiting and relearning the skills to fix our possessions is as much an act in the interest of saving items from the landfill as it is a radical opposition to disposal being the norm. In a way, this kind of mending activism echoes some of what was going on in the 1970s with the patchwork. The 1970s was also a time of increasing interest in environmental issues, which could be related to the aesthetic movements that promoted mending. I believe that now this mending activism has only become more prominent. Another thing that makes this more poignant is the fact that fast fashion has resulted in lower quality clothes that are actually much more difficult to mend. It was more common in the past to have larger seam allowances and or construction techniques that facilitated mending. In a way, clothes used to be designed to be mended, whereas today this is rarely the case. Mending in this context becomes almost more radical because you're investing the same amount of time, mending takes time, um, for something that is inherently less fixable. Speaking as someone who mends their clothing, the time spent repairing my clothes can be a period of meditation and reflection on some of these issues. More than other textile arts that involve creating something new, which I also practice, I find mending to be a restorative activity that helps me to mediate my response to the world around me. Mending, in this case, is a focusing activity intended to train the attention and achieve a mentally clear and emotionally stable state. In other words, it is a form of meditation. Here again, we find links to non-Western practices and perspectives that influence the relationship one can have with mending. Meditation has deep roots in various spiritual and religious traditions, particularly Eastern ones like Hinduism and Buddhism, and it is currently experiencing a resurgence in the West. Mending, in particular visible mending, can be a celebration of the beauty that objects acquire through use and repair. This, to me, is a more fruitful metaphor with which to approach life than to focus on achieving an unblemished perfection. And I believe that the renewed interest in mending we are experiencing today is a reflection of this. And to bring it back to sewing, 
I want to finish the speaking portion of this evening with a quote by one of my favorite artists, Louise Bourgeois, who did a lot of interesting work with textiles, particularly around themes of degradation and repair. It's not specifically about mending, however, I think it can certainly be applied to mending as a practice. The act of sewing is a process of emotional repair. Thank you. All right, so I'm gonna take a moment to set up the demonstration. We're gonna be doing a patching technique on a pair of jeans like we saw in the last object. Um, and yeah, so hit me with questions. Thank you, Caitlin. That was excellent. Very informative. Uh, there was some great little uh, comments in the chat that I will read some of them to you. And I just before I do that, I just want to remind people that you're welcome to please put your questions in the Q&A part of the chat. And uh, some of the comments that people were talking about, especially on the uh, about poverty, um, Someone who's wondering about extreme poverty or maybe just determined to not waste anything or maybe somebody who just found the aesthetic fascinating about mending for when you're you're poor. Um, Suzanne had commented on make do and mend as also an unofficial policy during the war years to deal with the shortages created by rationing and difficulties with supply being available. Consider the cargo ships being sunk while en route. So I, I agree. It seems to me all my um, past experiences with mending was just because of poverty or you're trying to make something last or you're, it's a secondhand clothing from a, an older sibling. So these are... Um, all such interesting um, reasons why people would mend. Uh, somebody said that they recall patching and doing embroidering on her daughter's jeans when she was very young, butterflies and flowers, such as a 1970s thing that was very popular in the 70s. <laughs> um, I love it. And they is saying, how important was the sewing machine to the resurgence of mending? People could finally afford them this pandemic, uh, during this pandemic, people are purchasing sewing machines due to boredom. How important is the sewing machine and its availability? So what are your thoughts on that, Caitlin? Oh, that's a that's an interesting question. Um, most of the mending I actually do is by hand. Um, it really depends on what, what, um, yeah, what if you have access to a sewing machine or not, and also what you're mending. Sometimes it's more difficult to get into the, a finished garment to the area that needs to be mended. Um, I think that in some ways, the sewing machine has been negative for mending, but only because it's been negative, I think, for sewing skills overall. Um, needle skills used to be something that everyone, or at least all women had, it's, it's a gendered skill. Um, and when the sewing machine happened and things became more industrialized and we started having more clothes made um, in factories, the skills, the skills of, um, the skills uh, for sewing just sort of like people stopped doing them because they didn't need to. Um, certainly a sewing machine helps with, with different kinds of men's and usually, I guess probably I'll use my machine and hand sew some parts of my mend. Um, so just to get this started right now, so this is a pair of jeans that I have um, that I haven't worn for several years because the butt is like very threadbare. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be placing a patch over top in this fabric, which is a cotton that I dyed with indigo this past summer. And what I usually do is I place it just over top of where I want it to be, and then I literally sketch the shape that I want in pencil, like just roughly doesn't have to be exact. I'm going to try going around the pocket. And then I just cut around that, leaving a couple centimeters on each side. While you're demonstrating, uh, Caitlin, I'm just going to add some of the other comments that people are saying. 
Catherine had commented her mother turned the collars on our school uniforms as they wore out and the collars on dad's shirts. Have you ever had any experience doing that kind of mending yourself? Yeah, actually, um, I, a couple summers ago or for a couple summers, I worked at Fort Edmonton Park um, in Edmonton. And a lot of that job is repairing the clothes that the costumed interpreters are wearing. And it was there that I got um, exposure to a lot of those more classic, I would say, um, mending, mending techniques. Um, that and like replacing underarms in shirts. Um, and yeah, sometimes just patching holes in knees and the butt of pants and stuff like that. So I have done a little bit, probably not as much as your mom. <laughs> Thank you for sharing. Yes, it's always those areas that uh, get worn out first. Um, Catherine has also commented on a fine couture is a combination of machine sewing and oops, machine sewing and fine needle skills, but appreciate how much we've lost the needle skills for the speed of the machine. Mm -hmm. um, that's a very good point. Most people don't have know the art of mending or just basic um, stitching anymore. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of people who, well, my thing with, with mending another person's clothes is that I will charge them if they want me to do it on my own, but I won't charge them if they'll do it with me. <laughs> So I can interesting. Take, yeah, usually it's just friends that ask me. So I'm like, if you want to pay me, I'll do it by myself. But if you want to make it th this a fun learning experience and hang out with me, you know. So the next thing that I'm doing is that along the pencil lines, which probably you can't see, but I can, is I'm folding the patch down um, and just basting the edges down with sewing thread, just very loosely, very roughly. This is so that when I lay the, lay the patch on top of the fabric and sew it down, the raw edges, there aren't any raw edges that will, um, I don't know, fray in the wash. You can also do this on a machine. Notice that I'm not using an iron or anything. Um, the heat from my hands is enough to give like a pretty decent crease. Well, I would say you must have very warm hands because I always need an iron to press anything. <laughs> I'm presenting to 60. Yeah, I'm warm. <laughs> There's a few questions coming in now too. Um, I'll just ask them as you're as you're uh, mending away. Can you talk a little bit, bit about shashiko, the Japanese mending method that tries to make the patch as visible as possible and embellished? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I almost added shashiko to this presentation. Um, but there wasn't time, and frankly, I'm not an expert. So sashiko is a is a style of embroidery that is has been very popular recently in the West, um, and yeah, it has a very recognizable aesthetic. I'm sure you've seen it. Usually, it's white thread on indigo, um, and it's usually patches that are placed over top and then decorative stitching. It's a practice that has been that was born in working class and poorer. Um, social classes in Japan, um, and it's been practiced for thousands of years. The garments that exist um, in museum collections um, that were made by Japanese people are, are just amazing. Essentially, they're taking scraps and sewing them together. Um, they would other, otherwise be unusable um, into something, yeah, just, just so, so striking. Um, yeah, lately, I'm not sure. There's a lot of there's a lot of good books you can you can um, find on it that are written in English, um, and yeah, it's it, it 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 does relate to, as far as I understand it, it relates to the Japanese idea of wabi sabi, which is the appreciation or the understanding um, that things become beautiful through use and repair and the beauty of transience. So. Oh, it sounds like that philosophy is perfect for mending. It is. It is. So much of mending, and I emphasize this a lot in the presentation, that there's there's a lot of Eastern influences that have that have come into mending. So much of mending, um, our mending practices are, are related to or come from philosophies that aren't like Western or European originally. 
and I really wanted to communicate that in this presentation. Excellent. Good. Uh, one quick question. Somebody is asking what kind of fabric are you using for this patch on the jeans? This is just a plain weave cotton fabric. Um, usually when I'm choosing fabric for mending, you want to choose something that is more or less the same weight as what you're mending, if not a little bit lighter. Um, ooh, I think I did this one. I think I put the, um, we might have to patch the other side. That's okay. Um, yeah, so you don't want something, sometimes you make your mend so intense that it actually puts more stress on the fabric around the area that is damaged. So that's why, that's why I try and choose something that's a little bit lighter, the same weight or a little bit lighter than the area that you're mending. Okay. Yeah, this is a plain cotton that I dyed with indigo over the summer. That makes sense. There is a comment here from Kim. Uh, she's referring to sewing machines have changed a lot in the last 30 years compared to the 100 years before. Her user, the user manual for her 1972 Elna is 50 pages long and assumes a lot more skill than the five page manual that comes with your average big box store domestic sewing machine these days. Of course, the Elna also costs the equivalent of $4,000 new compared to $150, $150 for a cheap machine at Walmart. So true. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think, I think, um, there is a lot to be said about just sewing nowadays is just back to the basics and having so many different um, sergers and other specialty machines doing embroidery stitches instead of really learning how to use your sewing machine and know how to tailor things. Okay. Yeah, there's definitely a, a reduced familiarity with basic principles of textiles and sewing um, that I've noticed. Um, for a long time, it's like the tutorials and the different learning sources that we had online were just like, we're going to make this as simple as possible just to get people to even try it. Um, and that meant sacrificing some of the quality of the instruction and the quality of the results, which can be really frustrating. I find that really frustrating. Um, but lately, I've seen a sort of a movement towards like doing things that are more complicated, I guess, mm -hmm. like really going to what the fundamentals are and learning them. Which is why I advocate hand sewing. That's why I'm doing it now. Because it, it, it doesn't take as long as you think it does. <laughs> well, I guess when you're experienced, you make it look very easy and quick. Yeah. I have a com. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, I have a comment here from somebody else. Um, uh, Margaret, she says, I'm in my late 60s and took six years of home economics in school, which means I learned to make my own garments as well as to men. I learned to knit over 60 years ago and even though and I know how to darn, although I don't enjoy it, I often replace toes and socks rather than darn them. My children grew up with fabrics as an option in junior high and both know how to make and repair clothing, but often don't, except for buttons and hems, know how to sew. But I know many young people never learn any of these skills because their parents don't know them and these things are no longer taught in school, except as possibly maybe as an option. So those are very good uh, points, Margaret, is that these skills are being lost because no longer they being uh, transferred skills the traditional way through generations they're being uh, their skills that are just no longer seemed necessary in the school system what are your comments on that Caitlin well first of all shout out to a human uh, home economics grad I'm also a home economics grad my undergrad is in um, the new name for it at the U of A is human ecology but that's what I'm educated in so yay um, yeah it's it's fallen away in a lot of ways, and a lot of that is related to fast fashion um, and just sort of like prioritizing different things. Um, I do see, I feel like now there's sort of a, a movement against that, like a return to learning these types of things. Um, but yeah, it, 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 it's definitely sort of a shame. Um, so now what I'm doing is, yeah, I turned the, the, um, wrong, the um, edges down the wrong side so now the mend is going on the other side of the jeans but that's okay because they were both needing to be patched and I'm just pinning it down um, and then I'm gonna go around the edges again with a thread a different thread grab a different color and I'll show you the basket um, 
or sorry, the blanket stitch that that was used on the um, of that those um, really wonderful jeans that we looked at to secure it. I have another comment coming in too while you're uh, threading your needle. Uh, Patricia has commented, I recall my mother darning my father's wool socks or work socks. She would put the heel of the sock over the bottom of the glass bottle in order to keep the shape while darning. She would also patch her sheets to extend the life of the sheets, especially the bottom sheets. That's interesting, Patricia, that your uh, mother used a glass bottle. I'm sure people found any found objects to do their darning. At the museum here, we have lots of wonderful examples of sock darners. They're these little wool woolen or wooden egg shaped objects that are so neat. Um, I'm not sure if too many people have seen them, but Caitlin, you could probably speak on all the different found objects that people would use if they didn't have a sock darner. Yeah, I have a friend whose mother um, darned his socks and stuff and she used an old light bulb. Um, yeah, having a, so they're called darning eggs or darning mushrooms usually. Um, I really want one. I don't own one. They're made specifically for mending and they literally look like an egg or a mushroom. Um, and you put them in the sock to hold the shape that you want the fabric to be so that it won't um, sort of pull when you put your foot into it. Um, and it also stops you from accidentally sewing your mend like to the other side of the sock. Um, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know. You can use... I. Um, Sometimes I'll use like a jar, a cup, a light bulb is great. Um, I know of someone who talked about using a doorknob. This was when they were young, so they would kneel on the floor and put the sock on the doorknob. Um, you can use all sorts of things. Anything that basically you can't accidentally puncture with a needle would be great. So I'm anchoring. I'm using a thicker linen thread for the, the decorative stitching that we're going to see. Um, I almost never use knots when I'm hand sewing. Um, they're likely to pull out um, and what's more effective usually is to just take tiny stitches in the place where you want the thread to be um, and this sort of creates friction within the fabric itself that stops it from pulling out. So pro tip that I like. Sometimes knots are useful though. So what you do for, let's see if we can get this down closer and there's what you do for a blanket stitch um, is you'll pull the thread out to the edge of your patch and then you'll put the needle in adjacent to it but say like a centimeter down from the edge so you can see that and then bring it back up to the edge then you make sure that the thread is looped around the needle so that when you pull it through, sometimes that's hard when your thread is thick, out of the way, there you go. It's sort of like, maybe I shouldn't have used blue, I might do another one that's not in blue. Um, but you can see that it has a line here, and then it also has a line of thread here, so it's edging along. The patch. While you're doing the blanket stitch, Caitlin, uh, there's a few more questions I'll throw at you. Mm -hmm. um, why do they use different types of sewing fabric, sewing machine or sewing fabrics for machines? Um, I'll just start with that question. Um, I'm not sure what's meant by different sewing fabrics, to be honest. I think Edward's asking uh, the different types of sewing machines. Oh, okay. Uh, well, different sewing machines will do different things. Most of this, the sewing machines that people, like domestic sewing machines are called lock stitch machines. Um, and they create like a, like a sturdy running stitch and sometimes it goes in different directions. Um, but yeah, then you have things like sergers, sometimes they're, which um, enclose the edge of something. Um, which is useful. And there's also machines that are specifically for hemming, um, overlock machines that sort of hem and serge at the same time in a way, um, sewing machines that do nothing but zigzag, because getting a really neat zigzag is important, particularly when you're making things like lingerie, because um, the stretchiness of a zigzag stitch is important and you want it to be really neat. 
Um, so yeah, different machines for different applications. Good, thank you. Well, we'll answer. So Mary is uh, commenting that she's 59 years old and just learning how to darn socks. I didn't learn from my mom, who has passed away, but I've learned from YouTube. I'm using her wooden mushroom, though. So YouTube can be a replacement for intergenerational learning. Thank you for that comment, Mary. You're right. Yeah, I go to YouTube a lot. Further to that, Lynn, uh, Mary also said, I guess my question is, has YouTube and social media increased interest in mending? I think so. Yeah, I think that's probably a resounding yes. Um, I showed my mom the mending video that we were gonna look that we looked at today earlier, and she got really excited about it and said she was gonna post it to her Facebook. So yeah, people love seeing cool stuff like that. There's also like a whole group of people on YouTube that make that make like a life, um, like making sewing videos. Like that's how they earn their money. So yeah, there's a. I think that there is a lack, a seeming lack, or people feel a lack of, yeah, that intergenerational instruction, and they go to the internet um, for those things. Okay, I'm gonna do a different color now. Well, and I'd always also say that uh, there's many people joined on tonight to watch you learn how to mend, so the uh, internet is a fabulous source for, for learning if you don't have um, that intergenerational option. So Faye has asked, or how many of us grew up watching someone that could mend or sew or knit? Both my grandmother sewed, my grandfather mended net, nets and braided. I saw a lot of people being industrious with materials. So that's true. It's not just something that females did, that um, the male gender also learned how to um, do nets and um, all sorts of things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when I was doing research for this presentation, I came across a lot of really great, there, for some reason there's a genre of, paint, of, paint, of paintings that are about people repairing fishing nets. So like usually men sitting and, and like fixing holes in their fishing nets. There's a ton of like, yeah, just paintings that feature that. Um, and I thought that that was just such a wonderful thing. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, like, a, like a, a practice that transcends gender and time and geography. Even the indigenous people, both male and female, learn how to bead. So I think that's fantastic too. Catherine is asking, where are you getting linen threads? Again, I find that your fab our fabric stores are depleted of natural threads and no darning yarns. Hmm. I so agree. Sorry, there's a needle in my mouth. I so agree with you. It makes me really sad. Um, there's a couple of specialty stores that you can get them from. Um, Ones that I can think of off the top of my head are Mewa. I don't know where this, sorry, what was the name of this person? Um, it's gone. I think it was Catherine. Catherine, um, with the excellent question. Um, if you're in Canada, Mewa, um, which is based in Vancouver, carries a lot of great um, specialist textile supplies. Their main, their main thing is natural dyeing, um, and I go there and I take workshops and stuff like that, but they have a lot of great, I think they have linen thread. They have, they have if you wanna get some special sashiko supplies, they also sell those. Um, there's a place in Nelson, BC of all places that might carry linen thread. Um, this brand is Londonderry Linen. Um, you might be able to see that you can find a, a bunch of different places. If you're in the US, Burnley and Trowbridge, they're based in Williamsburg, Virginia. Um, and they specialize in historical sewing supplies, they carry linen thread as well. And that's where I get my like um, sort of all-purpose linen thread. It comes in like these bigger, um, like on these big things. It's good quality. But yeah, very good point. I find the sewing landscape and the sewing supply fabric landscape locally to be extremely depressing um, these days. <laughs> it's really good if you like quilting. Um, there's lots of quilting fabrics available. Um, and there's lots of dancewear because a lot of moms who have kids in dance will make their costumes. But other than that, yeah, it's really hard to find nice natural fibers that aren't cotton especially. Thank you. There's a comment here from uh, Margaret who says quilt shops 
will sell 100% cotton thread and sometimes wool cotton blends. Cotolana is a cotton wool thread from Madeira Threads. Thank you, Margaret, for sharing that. Okay. And Sharon is asking, what technique would you use to mend moth holes in a sweater? Mm, that's a good question. It depends on how big the moth hole is. I'm assuming it's quite small. Um, I would do probably a woven darn. Um, and there's, it's, it's just a very basic darn for knitted fabrics. Um, we saw them in both, uh, in both the mittens and the cardigan. It's where you reweave a small section um, over top of the over top of the um, over top of the hole. That's probably what I would do if it was really small or if it was just like grazing, like it didn't go all the way through. Um, I might just like do a decorative satin stitch, kind of like an embroidery over top. Uh, so I'm going to try and demonstrate the blanket stitch again, just with the thread that is hopefully a little bit more visible. Caitlin, I just also have a comment from Catherine who says, could you please add these suppliers to a chat or post event resource sheet? I think Catherine, to, the best way to do that would be we can get these information from Caitlin after and when we send out um, our um, survey and thank you, we can hopefully add that resource into that so that everybody else can receive that information as well. Hopefully that answers your question. Mm -hmm. yeah, we can do that. So yeah, I'm there's sure. another comment in the chat saying um, that in Edmonton there's a business called Blenders Garment Recyclers, and they get all of their clothing that it's passed its sell by date at Value Village in Goodwill. They sell large bags full of light clothing. Uh, size or sex for $20 and then has a warehouse sale where they sell clothing by weight. Anything that is damaged, they hold uh, poof making classes. Um, they're trying to lessen the clothing sent to landfills. I think that's an excellent comment. I think that's the biggest problem nowadays is that people might be coming back to the mending is because they really are concerned about all the clothing in the landfills. So like you had commented on that artist showing that heap of clothing um, as a fashion statement, but not. So excellent comments in the, in the chat box. Thank you. Yeah, I love blenders. You can follow them on Instagram. They do great work. Like I mentioned in the talk, one of the problems with fast fashion is that it just is such a, it's a critical volume. Um, people are like, oh, I'll just give it to Goodwill. There's just so much of it that it can't all be bought by other people and then used. Like it's just, it's a critical mass. So Blenders is, is uh, I, yeah, I was so pleased when I found out about them. May I break in for a second here? This is Suzanne with the Arts Council. I actually worked at a sorting center in France at an organization called MIUS, where we really had a, a conveyor belt with all of the donated goods that go to those bins like you see uh, here for, for Valley Village. And the amount of stuff that was donated, one that wasn't clothing, was <laughs> frightening, um, but it was all you know, separated by the type of material. Um, Things that were very light were shipped off to Africa. Things that were very heavy and winter coats and so forth were sent over towards Siberia and, uh, and Russia. There they were sorted at uh, facilities organized by the same company there. But it was really interesting to see, you know, one single um, piece, as soon as it was, you know, sorted into what kind of textile it was, it went to a, a sorter who looked the piece over. Nothing would make it back into a store unless it was in absolutely tip-top condition or something that said Hermes, because um, people did donate those. Um, anyway, it was a really interesting experience to be able to work on that line with the uh, the employees in Northern France and how they, um, you know, how they sorted that and how the life cycle of those donated clothes continued on beyond what we do with them. Um, so it was, it was very neat. Anyway, thanks for letting me talk. Thanks, Suzanne, for sharing. That's a great story. 
Uh, Maureen is uh, chatting in. It says, I have repaired knits, including sock toes and heels, using a crochet hook to mimic the knit stitch. It was the only way to repair a heirloom christening shawl, shawl invisibly. Mm -hmm. I'm, um, that's a really great point. That's a great technique to use. I'm assuming it had like, the stitches had like laddered down, um, like the knit fabric had, like a stitch had broken and then they laddered down. Um, yeah, it's the thing about mending is that there's so many different techniques and it's so related to what you're mending and what you want out of it. Um, yeah, I could spend like, I could spend days talking about different mending techniques and teaching them. So I have a question for you, Caitlin. Hmm. What is the most challenging piece of mending that you have done and why? And why did you mend it? Hmm. Uh, oh, that's a good question. Try and think. There's been a couple. Um, I have this one shirt that I really like. My parents bought for me a long time ago, um, and it it's like not it's not like I don't know nice or fancy or whatever. Um, and I've had it for years. I think since high school. And the elbows were just it was a very soft sort of cotton twill, and the elbows were just completely wearing out, and. I don't know, I love it, it's so comfortable. And I was just like, oh my God, am I gonna, am I gonna like patch this whole, like it was a huge area. Um, I'm like, no, I have to, I love this thing. So I did, and I actually like it better now because um, the mending looks really cool. So is that a good example of emotional mending? <laughs> yeah, I think so. It's mostly, it's a, it's a shirt I only wear at home. So it's not like anyone sees it purely my emotional attachment to that one shirt. Interesting. Good. And so what point is a garment beyond mending? Um, I think that that probably is up to you to decide. Um, like that cardigan that we saw, I think a lot of people would have given up on it way, way, way before mm -hmm. person who owned it did. Um, but it meant something to them. I, like with that garment, you're literally inventing fabric with your men's. Um, things that have just worn completely away. Um, yeah, so it's it's such an emotional decision. Um, yeah, and probably a decision that you make about your time as well, because the farther you go along, the more time you have to put on it, put into it, and um, over time, things just get worn down. The fibers will degrade chemically, so it's not just mechanical issues anymore. Um, it might be literally falling apart. Do you want to keep putting effort into it? Um, does it matter if there's very little of the original fabric left in it to you? Um, would you, how do you feel about just buying a new one? Those are good questions. And uh, Faye is uh, chiming in here too, saying fire damage or mold will ruin fire fibers as well. Mm -hmm. So at what point is fire damage or mold going to um, make something irreparable? Yeah. Or can you fix fire damage and mold in, in mold in um, a garment? It's hard to fix like smells um, and stuff. Like there's just things, some things that you're not gonna be able to get rid of. It's almost all of you ran out. Yeah, uh, Caitlin, point. I'm just gonna interject. Uh, just going back through the chat, there were just a few comments that were made by attendees. Mm -hmm. uh, one was, I recall my mother darning my father's work socks. She would put the heel of the sock over the bottom of a glass bottle in order to keep the shape while darning. She would also patch our sheets to extend the life of the sheets, especially the bottom sheets. Mm -hmm. And further to that, another commenter said that soup ladles make excellent darning eggs. I love it. <laughs> yeah, really, whatever you have that works. These mugs and stuff. I find it interesting, the comment about bottom sheets. I also have mended my bottom sheets. I thought I was the only one. There's another comment here saying, I once mended my partner's jeans so many times that they were more patched than original fabric. The last time I wrote DNR across the inside of the bum, which he didn't notice for a while. I was amused though. <laughs> That's a good story. 
Um, so there's another comment over here in the question Q&A um, from Kim. Knit repairs alone can fill an hour or two. I go back and forth between Swiss darning, a duplicate stitch, woven darns or knitted patches, all of these on socks and sweaters. Yes, good comment. It is very time consuming to do any kind of mending. Yep, absolutely. I usually, um, I do a lot of um, duplicate stitch because usually my habit is to stop wearing a thing like directly before it wears out or actually makes a hole, which is what happened with these jeans. I don't think I've worn them in years just because, yeah, I'm like one day, like it's just about to blow. Um, so, and it is actually a lot of the times easier to do a mend before there is an actual hole. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. It just depends on your habits, I guess. Irene here is asking for a suggestion on how to fix a hole in the knee of lined, heavyweight child's ski pants. Oh, very good question. Mm. Um, for the like outside fabric or the lining? Um, it doesn't say. It just says heavyweight child's ski pants. Mm. I would probably say the outside. Um... Yeah, I think for that case, um, I would, because ski pants are usually waterproof, um, I would find a similar fabric that's also waterproof or water resistant and then do a patch over top, um, like sew it down. I would hand sew it, that gives you more control over what layers that you go through. Um, the more holes that there are from your stitches will decrease its ability to resist water, um, which might be which might be sort of something that makes you not want to mend them. Um, but yeah, I would hand sew a patch over top, probably. I know that they also do, like at MEC, you can get patches that are like iron on in waterproof fabrics. Um, that could be a little difficult with the lining. Another thing you can do is just unstitch the lining at the, at the cuff um, and then lift it up so you can just deal with the, um, the thing that has the, the hole in it. Okay. Though. And Suzanne is asking, is there a technique to repair tears on synthetic ski jackets or pants? Um, similar, the mech, offer, mech has like patches you can do. Um, if you really want to maintain the waterproof aspect of them, that's what I would go for. Um, yeah, otherwise you can probably use just a, yeah, just a patch of a similar fabri fabric if you don't mind having a couple holes. Um, yeah, it's, it's frustrating that, that garments that are made of technical fabrics can be a lot more difficult to mend um, because the function of the fabric is so specific. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. So Andre is uh, commenting back to the mending sheets. The old time technique was to split the sheet up the center, then flip the center to the edges and sew a seam up the middle for, I, I believe this is for the bottom sheets. That makes sense. I love Does it. Does that sound familiar to you, Caitlin? Yeah, that's great. It makes a ton of sense. Cause yeah, the all, most of the wear comes in the middle where mm -hmm. you're, you're laying. So the outsides are a lot sturdier. Yeah. That makes sense to me too. Suzanne Hermery says, I have a beloved woolen scarf, variegated that's purchased in New Zealand that was later eaten by moths, mm -hmm. tried to use embroidery thread to pinch the holes closed. Maybe you have some other suggestions. Um, yeah, for that kind of thing, using those reweaving techniques that we talked about um, that will create the new fabric. Um, you could also, sometimes people just roll with the holes. They'll just do like a, um, like a, like a, they'll enclose the, the edges of the um, hole with embroidery thread or whatever. So you still have a hole, um, but it's finished so it doesn't keep, it, keep um, unraveling. And you can do it either to match or to have a different color um, to be contrasty and fun or just kind of like low key finished hole. I don't know if that makes sense. Thank you, Caitlin. 
Um, Kim has commented that she's reached the point where there just wasn't enough fabric left to sew patches to, and sewing patches on top of each other made for a lumpy and unpleasant fabric. Good comment. Yep, it happens. Uh, just to throw back to the uh, ski pants question, um, someone here in the chat said that Gore-Tex patches might be an option for the ski pants, that they've used Gore-Tex patches for mending tears and covers on outdoor patio furniture covers, and it worked well. So that's a suggestion. Yeah, Gore-Tex is great for those kinds of things. And Faye has also suggested waterproof spray for shoes and tents. Spray over once it's mended. That mm. sounds like a good idea. Sounds like people have ha already come up with some very creative solutions to mending some of their favorite items or their practical items. Yeah. Like I said, there's a million different ways to mend. Just an earlier comment. Um, there was a comment from Catherine saying thank you for this informative and needed workshop presentation. It was thoughtful, restful to watch, and hear others' experiences and skills. So thank you very much, Catherine. Thank you. Thank you for being here. And Laura has asked if you have a YouTube video suggestion or other source for mending a wool sweater buttonhole that is opening. Uh, the loops are no longer connected, so the hole is big. Yeah. Um, I don't know. I can't think of one specifically. You might consider searching, fixing a fixing buttonhole stitching um, on a sweater might be, or broken buttonhole stitching might be good search terms. Um, what I would do with you is I would just use regular sewing thread, cotton or polyester. I prefer cotton. Um, and then just sewing over the place where it's broken <clears throat> several times. And that will, the friction of the thread, friction is a big deal in sewing, um, and I think it's an under underappreciated force, um, will keep it in place. Okay, thank you. Um, somebody has commented back to the uh, sheet um, technique. It said that uh, mending sheets technique described exactly what their mother did to extend the life of their bottom sheets. So interesting, so many people have done it. Um, somebody else commented, I watched it once on YouTube about fixing wool, and, wool sweaters, why it is the case, why it is the case hole is largest. <laughs> and somebody's asking, where would you buy Gore-Tex patches? That's a good question. I would say probably mech as well. They're really good for that kind of thing. Anyways, so I did blanket stitch over most of this patch. There we go. And now I have the one part that was um, on the inside, it was very, very worn, is now covered. Now I can go on adding more patches. I don't know, one patch feels kind of weird. I feel like you need multiples. How are we for time? Uh, we still have half an hour. There's one more question and a couple comments. I'll, there's quite a few comments in the chat box. More people are in the chat box. So I'll just keep going through it. If you have another um, uh, demonstration to do, go ahead, Caitlin. Okay. Um, for technical repairs, I've recently seen repair shops that are slowly opening up that specialize in repairing sportswear. They can be really good for getting ideas on how to repair your own gear or if the repair um, is beyond the skills you have, you can bring them to repair it for you. It's in Ottawa, Gatineau, and she's listed or he's listed um, facebook.com at LEA course piece also known as worn wear by Patagonia so there's two links in the chat box there so thank you I'm glad happy to see so many uh, positive comments and um, creative solutions from all the people joining in thank you for that uh, somebody else so Lindsay had said she likes Ren bird men's on Instagram she mends jeans as well and she's also taken some classes so very cool. Instagram. 
is a great place for mending. Um, if you're in Edmonton, another place that does mending is Arturo Denim. They do um, denim um, like jeans sewn in Canada. I'm actually wearing Arturo Denim right now. Um, but they also do a lot of repairs and they do some beautiful machine darning um, of jeans that um, probably a lot of people have considered sort of like unusable at this point. So I'm gonna demonstrate, this is a sock, an old sock of mine um, that you all get to look at, look at you guys that have a hole. Um, and I'm gonna demonstrate a woven darn, which we've mentioned a couple times and some people expressed interest in. Um, I don't have a darning egg and I can't use the ones in the collections. So I'm going to put my sock over a mug and I have, it's not like the best solution, but it works for me at this point. And I have an elastic band um, that I'm going to use to sort of secure it so it doesn't move as much. Hopefully that doesn't, a sec. Yeah. Voila. And then I choose a yarn that like I said before, with fabric, you want to choose a yarn that is the same thickness or a little bit lighter. This yarn um, is a bit thick, um, which is not ideal, but it will still work for this sock. This sock actually has no mate. I've had it for like a very long time. So I'm not too, too worried about it if this goes poorly, but yeah, normally you'd want something that was a little bit lighter. Um, and I'm using a pointy, like some, it's a darning needle, but it's still pointy. Um, I tried it with a regular darning needle earlier and it was, um, it was really hard to get it through the fabric. So I like to have a selection of darning needles, some that are pointy, some that are not. So Lindsay is asking if you have any information on speed weaves. Speed weaves? No, I don't. I've never heard of that actually. What is it? a good question. Lindsay wants to answer. I don't know. Yes. So what I'm going to be doing here is I'm going to be going um, burying the yarn probably um, like a couple centimeters away from the hole because um, like I said the area around the hole can all, around any damage can also be um, sort of fragile as well so you want to anchor any of the men's that you do whether it's patching or reweaving just a little, little uh, distance away from the actual hole to anchor it probably about here one back stitch and then bring it up and what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna go across and then go down once or twice through the other side and pull the needle through and you have one long float going over one side of the hole and you just go back you just do that until the whole thing is covered so that's what i'm going to do now a is sharing that she has cut a piece of material out the cap portion and now i'm sewing it onto a hat to cover the current logo Interesting. Thanks for sharing, Faye. I'm glad to see that there's people out there that are actually doing some mending along with you. And from Carolyn, she is saying speed weave is a tiny loom that weaves directly into your fabric. I don't have one. She saw one on the internet. Thank you, Carolyn, for sharing that. Oh, yeah, I have actually heard of those. And I know of a couple people who have who have them. Um, and apparently they work quite well. They're like a vintage thing, I think. Um, like a product that was, or a little tool that was manufactured. I've heard they're good. I've never used one. And somebody else has answered saying Speedweave was a brand name of a device called a darning loom. They're being made again. Etsy is the best source. They're based on the woven darn technique, but they help hold the warp threads straight. 
So, so thank you everyone for all these comments and questions. It's made it uh, a very interactive and interesting evening. Um, I think we will give Caitlin another five minutes to finish off this uh, how to darn a sock using a coffee cup because I think that's great. We are a little bit past our time of stopping at eight o'clock, but that's okay. Um, we got started a little bit later and it's nice to see Caitlin busy and to see so many um, engaged attendees. This is fantastic. So um, if you still have a few more comments and questions, you have a couple minutes to put them in. If I've missed them, my apologies. I'm doing my best to, to uh, reach everybody. Um, but somebody has also has left a link on YouTube on Speedweave in the chat box. And somebody has also commented that a Swift Darner by Beyond Repair 519 is another darning loom made in Ontario. So thank you very much for all your, your tips and your own tricks and creative solutions to mending. We really hope that you've learned lots from Caitlin here tonight. If you do have another question, you can um, put it in the Q&A box um, and I will, I will answer it there as well. Comments are saying, thank you, this was delightful. And uh, Lindsay is asking on Instagram or Etsy. I think she's asking in response to the Beyond Repair 519. Uh, thank you for this great session. I look forward to the embroidery session. Thank you for a very informative session. Loved it. Thank you from Katie. Oh, and I think I will go check on the phone we might be low on battery if we're i'll go check oh there we are again yeah we are it's 20 percent. okay yeah to get to the other side the next thing that you have to do is just go back the other way so you're just re essentially you're just weaving you've put down one direction of threads and i'll show you how to do this one's kind of coarse because i'm rushing but um Yes, battery power is running low. Um, Caitlin, do you have an Instagram? Somebody is asking. <laughs> yeah, I do. It's Caitlin.Carbonic. I'll type that in. And just to interject, um, I just wanted to let everyone know here, we've been talking about programs that are coming up in April. Um, we should have those up on our website at redyearmuseum.com. Uh, dot com a little bit later tomorrow uh, we were just waiting on announcements and seeing what we could offer online and in person uh, so we will definitely get that open for registration at reddeermuseum.com and also Caitlin has done uh, three short videos on the topic of mending with the mags collection and we're going to be getting that onto our youtube page here uh, probably in the next week or so um, so there's three short videos where she highlights three different garments from the mags own clothing and textile collection and our YouTube page is uh, Red Deer Mag. Thank you, Carly, for that. Yeah. Uh, there's just a few more thank yous. This was great, thank you. I was lucky to have been brought up being taught how to mend, so knit, etc. cetera. They're skills I really cherish. Thank you for this session. Love seeing the samples and your mending. Thank you so much for this. It has been very informative and I love your enthusiasm. This was a great session, very in informative. Um, thank you for treating a common subject with such passion, happy mending. So I think at that point, if you have any other comments, further comments, Caitlin, we'll wrap it up here before the uh, battery dies on the phone. Uh, from Jeff, your parents are so proud, Caitlin. <laughs> Thanks, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Love you lots. Uh, we also have just a comment on our Facebook page, because uh, this is streaming to our page there. Um, we have Matt here agreeing with you that uh, Maiwa is fantastic and has fantastic natural fabrics and natural dyes. No end of trouble that you could get into. Seriously. <laughs> and from Edward, he says, happy, keep up with the good fixing, sewing, ripped clothes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Edward. Yeah, I'm just going back and forth and reweaving. It looks like you're creating your own little loom and you're weaving back and forth. Yeah, that's exactly it. Great job, Caitlin. Really enjoyed this session. 
Thank you. And I have to say, I guess I have no excuse anymore for not mending anything. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe I do, but I'll, I'll, I'll try not to use them. <laughs> I am literally learning that I've darned socks wrong for my entire life. I mean, I'm going to be honest and say I've never darned one. <laughs> Even in a hurry, your darn your darning is straighter than mine, and I have a lot of practice. <laughs> That's a great comment. I don't know. Hopefully, I don't have to redo this later. But you get the gist, right? Yes, we do. <laughs> Sometimes it's just doing it good enough for whatever time, whatever level of time, willingness, whatever you got going on. Sometimes it's just good enough. That's what this darn is. So thank you everyone for joining us. And thank you, Caitlin, for offering such an informative and fantastic session on mending. Uh, we will, as you can see in the, in the post, uh, or in the chat, Carly has mentioned that tomorrow afternoon we will post our April events on uh, reddeermuseum.com calendar. And uh, we will also forward any um, lists of sources that Caitlin had mentioned in her talk tonight so that we can send that out in a post. Uh, oh, email. so anyone who's local, if um, I'm not sure when we'll be open again, but I curated a small exhibition on mending with a couple more examples of mending from our collection. So come on down if, yeah, if you're around and if we're open eventually one day. Great. Thank you. Well, hopefully sooner than later. Hmm. I think one final comments I see here from Carolyn. Um, she says there are different techniques and if your hole is fixed, it's not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Very good comment. Well, we also want to thank everybody from joining us from all over uh, Canada and Australia and some places in the States. We are humbled that uh, that we uh, have been able to offer a webinar that would be so wide reaching. And um, Carly has also put a donation link into the chat line if you find this uh, webinar valuable that you can just go directly to that link and you can uh, make a donation. We would much appreciate it. Um, thank you very much um, for attending. And I think, Caitlin, if you have any other comments, we will probably end the evening. Thanks so much for your coming, guys. This has been really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. It was so great. Hope you have a good evening. <laughs>